Peace and blessings, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Amir Ahmed. I serve as Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, here at University of Vermont. I use he, him pronouns. Really thank you for joining us today, the, uh, the third day uh, of the Inclusive Excellence Symposium, an evolution of the Blackboard Jungle Symposium, uh, which was originally uh, created 15 years ago. Uh, to support and provide professional development for faculty teaching at the University of Vermont. Uh, and now it's evolved into this university-wide program for faculty, staff, and students um, uh, to be able to facilitate critical conversations and construct new and promising inclusive practices, uh, foster conversational spaces uh, where we have a free exchange of ideas and perspectives and beliefs in which all are welcomed, appreciated, and valued. Uh, to this year's theme is at the intersection of DEI and sustainability. Uh, and as, as you, if, for those of you who've attended earlier this week, you know that I, I find this to be a critical um, uh, topic and, and theme for our university for years to come. And, and you'll see, we'll continue to flesh that out further and further over the course of the week. Uh, before I proceed, I, uh, I'd like to share uh, a land acknowledgement. The University of Vermont is located on the waters and lands uh, which have long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous people for thousands of years and is home to the Western Abenaki people. UVM seeks to honor, recognize, and respect these peoples, especially the Abenaki, as the traditional and enduring stewards of the waters and land. With these intentions, we will begin today by acknowledging that the institution of University of Vermont and many in our UVM community are guests on this land. Institution, the institution's role as a guest is to respect the waters, the lands, and indigenous knowledge interwoven within them and uplift the indigenous peoples and cultures present on this land and within our community. While this land acknowledgement is an essential starting point, there is much work ahead. And as we come to terms with these legacies and traumas of indigenous disposition, we work uh, to further our relationships and connections. Uh, and, and on Friday in particular, uh, I encourage you uh, to consider our ongoing uh, evolution in strengthening and building these connections and relationships and integrating it into who we are and what we do as a university. I am so honored by the opportunity to introduce our speakers today. As many of you know, um, we, uh, who've attended the previous days, we've had amazing uh, speakers for our symposium this year. Uh, our friend uh, Naima Peniman joined us on Friday. Uh, was so thankful for her contributions uh, and sharing the work of Soul Fire Farm. Uh, yesterday we had uh, Christy Drutman, uh, also known as Brown Girl Green, uh, who did an amazing job and brings a, 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 a young generation's voice uh, to the work of environmental justice. And today we have uh, my good friend from completely different separate trajectories of my life, uh, which I'm so happy to see them working together on this important work, uh, Delma Jackson III and Kavitha Rao. Delma Jackson III is an activist, facilitator, writer, counselor, and lecturer. His research covers a variety of issues, including American pop culture and media, literacy, Islamophobia in America and abroad, hip hop in the context of a black musical legacy, sexism in media, linguistic authenticity and cross-cultural dialogues, white identity, America's love affair with violence, the legacy of black comedy in America, African-Americans and hit history of healthcare and African-Americans in the context of US housing policy. He's earned a uh, bachelor's degree in African-American studies and psychology from Eastern Michigan University and a master's degree in liberal arts with a focus on African-American studies from University of Michigan. <coughs> Excuse me. He has lectured on various topics across multiple venues, including New York University's Tisch School of Performing Arts, Toledo University's Graduate School of Criminal Justice, Yale University's School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and twice at the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in Higher Education. Kavitha Rao is a, is a, is a mother, facilitator, mediator, consultant, and practitioner. As daughter of immigrants to the United States, she has always been curious about the difference and how about difference and how we make meaning through connection to land, community, and place. 
Kavita brings over 20 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, focused on transformational leadership and facilitation, building community and authentic partnerships across difference, and using creativity and collective visioning to work towards reparations and healing. Her understanding of the possibility of change and healing is deeply influenced by her training in yoga therapy, craniosacral therapy, Ayurveda, and mindfulness. She brings her, these tools to her leadership and facilitation work, recognizing how important knowing ourselves and personal healing is in our efforts to heal our planet and build community. She has worked with the Center for Whole Community since 2006 as a facilitator, trainer, and consultant, and is excited to bring more embodied practice to our offerings uh, and, our <clears throat> and our understanding of the many ways to support change. Prior to that, she co-founded Common Fire, a nonprofit that created intentional communities centered in justice, ac accessibility, and sustainability. And I'm honored to have uh, experienced Common Fire. What a beautiful space. Kavitha is a member of Cultural Shift Agency and the Emergent Strategies Ideation Institute, a team of facilitators, mediators, and coaches, serves on the board of Soul Fire Farm, which we learned about on Monday, and is on the leadership for the Wild Seed Community Farm in Healing Village. It is my honor to introduce Doma Jackson III and Kavitha Rao, and I'll turn it over to Kavitha. Thank you so much, Amir. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who is a part of organizing this conference and bringing us um, together. And I just also want to thank all of you who are participating in this. I want to name that it's a little awkward to know that there's numbers and numbers of you and I don't get to see you. I'm so, you know, looking forward to when we can do these things in person. Um, as Amir mentioned, my name is Kavita, um, and I'm just so honored to be here today with my dear friend and co-conspirator, Delma Jackson III, and we come to you by way of our work with the Center for Whole Communities. Um, for those of you who are in Burlington, our offices are just down the road from you, um, Lakeside, and um, but our team is spread out across Turtle Island, so I'm zooming into you today from um, New York State. I live just east of this beautiful river um, that was known by the original stewards of this land as the Mohicanatuck River, or the river that flows both ways, the waters that are never still. And um, I'm going to start with a poem. And um, before I begin, I just want to um, invite you, if you have, you know, anything in your hands or your lap, if you're able to set it aside for a moment. If you wanna stand up and stretch, or if you wanna you know, yawn, feel free to do that. I just wanna invite you to maybe use your hands to, to just welcome yourself fully um, to being here. I sometimes like to bring my hands to the beating of my heart or to my gut, or maybe you know, there's a part of your body that can use a little extra care or attention right now. I also wanna invite you to just take a moment to look beyond the computer screen, to look you know, above and below and around you to just notice where you are right now. Maybe notice where the light is streaming in. Use your imagination to, to know where you are in relationship to the sun's trajectory um, in the course of its day. Take a moment to feel your connection to the ground beneath you. So if you're sitting maybe through your sit bones or if you're standing through your feet, just know that you know below these floorboards and the foundation of the building you're in, there's the earth supporting each one of us. Um, and as you kind of imagine your, your roots connecting you with that dirt, that soil, that clay, that stone, there's the there's the memory, right? The, the stories of all the life that's come before us and, and sort of how our presence here now draws us into the story of this place where we are. Um, so I want you to, you know, to bring, invite all of you to be here, your bodies, your hearts, your emotions, your ancestors, your guides, they're all welcome here. 
So here's a poem for you. This is called a radical gratitude spell. It's written by our dear friend and former colleague at Center for Whole Communities, Adrienne Marie Brown. She writes, you are a miracle walking. I greet you with wonder. In a world which seeks to own your joy and your imagination, you have chosen to be free. Every day as a practice. I can never know the struggles you went through to get here, but I know you have swum upstream and at times it has been lonely. I want you to know I honor the choices you made in solitude and I honor the work you have done to belong. I honor your commitment to that which is larger than yourself and your journey to love the particular container of life that is you. You are enough. Your work is enough. You're needed. Your work is sacred. You are here and I'm grateful. So again, I just wanna um, say again, how grateful I am that you've carved out this time to be here with us. Um, as I mentioned, Delma and I are with the Center for Whole Communities. The Center for Whole Communities exists to cultivate transformative leadership that weaves together and strengthens movements for justice and the environment. But at the heart, I, I feel like our work is really about healing. Um, we are a practice-based organization and we recognize that um, in order to heal, in order to transform from the very harmful and destructive um, impacts of the extractive economy that we live inside of, the supremacy culture that we've been raised within, um, it's gonna take more than our intellect to, to find our way out of it. So, you know, these are some of the practices that we've turned to that we found useful. So, um, you know, as, as we're seeking to transform um, the inequity that, that we're steeped inside of, there's a moment of recognition where we start to realize, you know, we are a part of what needs to be transformed too, right? We've been, um, and, and, and so these practices are really helpful tools that we found not only for, you know, pausing and bringing awareness to the ways in which we've been conditioned and have these patternings within us, but also opportunities for us to love ourselves within, within that discovery process, to have compassion for ourselves and for others as we're seeking to unlearn and find new ways of being together. And, um, and then we also know that any transformation is going to require community to support us through that change and um, to hold us accountable and so that collectively we can dream into new possibilities together, right? And so we bring in poetry, we bring in moments of silence, we start meeting sometimes with embodied check-ins. And these are not just for the sake of, you know, something pretty to begin with, but they're very intentionally offered to sort of disrupt, disrupt status quo, our, our normal um, business as usual ways of diving in. You know, you, you've come here to this symposium that's looking at these very important um, topics of this intersection of sustainability and equity and justice issues. And, um, and so there, you know, there's a very uh, likely tendency to want to roll up our sleeves and dive into strategies to to learn what we need to know to figure out our solutions together you know and that's all super important and you know th this brilliant mind and this intellect is welcome here too and we want to create space for all our other um sources of of knowledge of wisdom or other um ways of expressing our other um guides that might come to us in different ways too um, so as, um, you know, I'm about to pass the mic over to Delma, who's going to carry us through the majority of our time together today. And he's going to be sharing, um, a really powerful, uh, journey exploration around, uh, the story of white supremacy through the lens of multiple institutions. And it's a story that I've been blessed to hear over and over and over again and to see the iterations as they evolve and develop and grow as, um, as we continue to work in um, different spaces that are seeking to transform. And what I wanna ask of you or invite you into is a reflective process to bring your mind and openness to, to um, 
to hearing and being present with what Delma is going to share, but also to invite in all your other sources of knowing, you know, to, to check in with, you know, what your body or your emotions might be telling you, or, you know, sometimes we get some glimmers of information that might not even come from our lifetime, might come from generations past, you know, they're all welcome here. And as you're listening, I um, also want to invite you to think about how your story fits into this bigger story of whiteness that Delma is going to be talking about. And since we are here at this intersection of sustainability and you know, justice and equity issues, a question that we often will offer um, in spaces when we're working with historically white conservation organizations like the Nature Conservancy or the Yale School of Forestry, or even when we bring um, workshops to Facing Race Conference or other places, we'll um, pose this question, you know, how has your family of origin, your identity, the privileges you've walked within in your lifetime, the culture within which you were raised, how has that informed your relationship to land and to nature, right? So some for some of us, our relationship to nature came really easy. It was really readily available for others it was a different experience, you know, for some, our relationship to nature came from a very urban environment. For some, nature is a place of refuge or safety or escape. Um, for others, it didn't feel very safe, you know, whether that was through a lived experience of trauma or whether it was an inherited from generations before. For some, we interact with the earth as teacher or friend. For others, maybe it's a, a resource for us to use, you know, and all of these perspectives are valid um, and an important part of how we can start to figure out the puzzle of solutions that are going to work for all of us and for all of our stories. So um, with that, um, I'm going to pass it over to you, Delma. And, um, and again, thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Kavi. I appreciate that. <clears throat> um, if for any reason audio video stuff gets wonky on my end I invite any of my colleagues or support to let me know you could just interrupt me because I'm trying to shut off all of my notifications so I don't get interrupted by my own technology um, so feel free to just jump in if, if need be uh, thank you all for being here thank you all for the work that you're doing every day. Um, I have a lot to try to talk about in a fairly short amount of time. So I'm just going to dive in and do the best I can to cover what I can. Um, so as you probably know by now, um, our time together has been titled The Stories We Live In, Justice, Nature, and Narrative. And I always, anytime I'm um, sharing space to discuss a uh, story and its power or narrative and its power I often turn to this particular quote from Annette Simmons. If you wish to influence an individual or a group to embrace a particular value in their daily lives, tell a compelling story. I think this quote particularly highlights the power of story and narrative um, in ways that we can sometimes, I think, uh, take for granted. All right. So, with that, um, I always start with just uh, images of both past and more recent images, uh, present images to highlight uh, why I do this work and what is what at stake for me, at least in part. Um, so just giving honor to those who have come before us and those who will come after us as well. Um, Part of that whole philosophy for me is informed by this symbol, the Sankofa bird. Um, and I'll just briefly say that the, the symbol itself represents an idea, a broader idea that in order to better understand where you are, you have to understand where you've been because it informs where you are. And with that understanding, you can better uh, plan ahead for your future, right? And so inherent in this symbol is a disruption of our ideas around time. And the idea that time is strictly a linear uh, piece. This 
uh, symbol also represents the circularity of time and the idea that past, present, and future can be more complex and intertwined than um, our, our Western uh, worldview sometimes allows for in many uh, ways. So uh, it's just important to always name this as well. And with that, my dad is down there at the bottom. Hopefully you can see, you know, where it says dad, that's my dad, my aunt and uncle, that's his mom, my grandma. This is a family photo that was taken um, not too long after a lot of my family members found their way into the, um, what we now call Flint, uh, what was once and still is by all accounts, uh, unceded Potawatomi territory. Um, my family, like so many African-American families, um, moved up to an industrial-based economy in the Northern cities um, as a means of gaining access to resources and as a means of safety away from uh, some of the most violent domestic terrorism we've seen in U.S. history. And I'll get into that a little more uh, a little later. But this is one photo of many that act as kind of a touchstone or a launch point uh, for me personally. Um, my parents um, raised me here in this city in predominantly Catholic school settings. So at the top, this debonair young man you see here circled in yellow with the turtleneck, the pink turtleneck, that's, that's me. Uh, over here, we have the high school graduation. Uh, so I spent my K through 12 education in the Catholic school system. Um, and with that, uh, there was a lot of access Right. Uh, it was a fairly white, fairly wealthy school setting that I grew up in, which is very different from the community I was raised in on the north side of Flint, which was largely working class poor. Um, and as the city of Flint lost more and more industry, more and more jobs, um, the neighborhood that was a safe space when my parents bought that home uh, devolved, right, and became increasingly. Uh, violent and um, unsettled, to say the least. By the time I went off uh, for undergrad, I definitely harbored a lot of internalized racial oppression, right? Nobody was kind of explaining to me how systems worked. All I know is what I observed. All I know is what I was learning in school, particularly in the social sciences which led me to believe that there was just something inherently wrong with me, with folks who looked like me, with my community. Um, I would say I was initially politicized a little bit in undergrad with my first African-American studies course um, and definitely became angry as I learned more and more um, in terms of what I had been missing out on, the information that I just had never had access to. Uh, soon after gone, went off to the uh, Netherlands, which is, is where this picture was taken um, back in 1999. Um, soon after, uh, finished my undergraduate education, went into community organizing in Toledo, Ohio for a while, moved back to Flint, started a family. Um, we could see my three young ones over here. Uh, and around the time that I had my youngest is when I joined up with the Center for Hope Communities. And it's like this picture here was taken in Vermont with some of my colleagues and some of the folks that we were hosting. Um, and all of this time, it wasn't up until my time with the Center for Hope Communities that I'd even stopped to consider the impact of environment in any um, serious way. You know, um, for me, access to the outdoors was tempered by what was going on in my immediate surroundings. And as I mentioned, you know, this place was falling apart and no one was explaining the story behind it. And so I had developed an internalized story. I was living within a larger contextual story and none of this was clear to me. Um, 
And so as I began working with the Center for Folk Communities, I began thinking more and more about um, environment sustainability, what does it all mean, right? And where is my place in that? And why do I personally feel so disconnected from nature? Why have I not had these experiences that so many of my colleagues um, were able to talk about? And um, ended up going back to the Netherlands in 2014 and studying immigration and migration patterns in Western Europe. Um, started showing up at places like Encore conferences, um, came back to Flint, started teaching. And one of the things that um, really hit home for me, one of the things I'll never forget is part of my teaching included uh, summer work with high school age students who were doing um, classroom work in the afternoons, but in the earlier parts of the day in the summer when it was still not too hot outside, we would get out and do a lot of horticulture based work. We had a couple master gardeners on staff and they were taking us all out and um, teaching us as much as they could with the time we had about um, systems of nature itself, how we could be good stewards of the land. And so much of the feedback we would get initially from our students traces all the way back to that first image I showed you of my dad when he was a little kid and my grandma. Uh, so many of my students here in, in the city articulated the idea that they didn't want anything to do with the outdoors. They were really resistant. And it was rooted in the idea that for them, it felt like going backwards quite a bit, right? Like my family, our family, we got away from this sort of agriculture-based work. We got away from interacting with the ground, with nature. We got away from growing things. Why are you trying to put us back into that, that space, right? That, that to them, and to me, I realize that as I'm hearing them say it, I'm like, oh, right. That's where some of that resistance and that, not just resistance in the sense of I don't want to do the work, but what's connected to that work is trauma. And it was the trauma they were speaking to. And it was their observation at 15, 16, 17, that really brought home for me where some of my own resistance was. And so from there, you know, fast forward several years. And yet again, the very resource that this particular city is supposed to be able to depend upon is poisoning us, right? The Flint water crisis. And so the entire city has had to grapple with and reckon with what it means to be in connection to resources, what it means to be in connection to so-called expertise, right? That was responsible not only for the collapse of our economy, but eventually the collapse of our infrastructure around water. And so over and over again, this trauma that starts centuries back has a way of living with us in the now. And that's where that Sankofa symbol comes back into play. Uh, for so many of us, right? But I want to zoom out for a moment, if I can, and just point to the fact that we're talking story within story within story, right? So what is the meta story that I want to hone in on today? It has to do with uh, the story that the West has told itself and then disseminated outward, right, quite effectively. It has to do with a handoff of sorts that so many historians have challenged over and over again, where you have this through line that you could argue starts with, you know, Greco-Roman history all the way through today. This Western trajectory, this never ending West, right? And within that story, there is another story of racial progress equally inevitable, right? Just like the West is in an inevitable piece, so is our racialized progress here in the United States. And so you'll see that idea that we're constantly getting better, constantly moving forward, repeated within, 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 right? But for so many of us, for various reasons, we have a very different experience. And I wanted to just take a little bit of time and speak to that and where the roots and the foundations are of where that alternative story 
comes from that we don't necessarily always recognize, right? And I and so I want to launch all the way back as far as I can, as far as the written word will allow me to, as far as my own research goes, with Hippocrates, right? On airs, waters, and places, arguing that there's a connection between where people live, what we look like, and our character. This is a pre-racialized notion. We're not talking about race and racism yet. This is much earlier than that. But what it does is the, it plants a seed. It's an idea, and it's one of the oldest we've been able to find where this idea is articulated, that where I'm from and what I look like equates to who I am, right? And I just want to draw our attention to this very last line. You may judge of the rest without any risk of error. Um, a way of saying, in part, uh, if you've met one of them, you've met all of them, right? So hopefully you can appreciate um, the inherent danger of such an idea but it will be built on, right, over time. The notion of race as we understand it now, in a lot of ways, begins to really come online as Western nation states are on the rise, right? We're talking European nation states. And as they begin to explore, as they begin to conquest, as they begin to send out their missionaries, they're encountering various types of people in the trade routes and what have you and stories are being written, right? Again, that power of narrative, going all the way back to things like, you know, Marco Polo, um, some of the most virulent observations of the other you begin to seeing in some of those works that are, are published during this time. And so this is a, a crucial time period because what we see are writings in which, um, you know, with the press, the printing press coming online, we can begin to disseminate these ideas uh, for the first time across the West and in different languages. And folks are really starting to otherize, right? Even as they've otherized each other in Western Europe, they're beginning to otherize within the context of a global community. And so um, I wanna start, there's so many institutions I could draw on and point to, but I'm just gonna pick a few out. Right. And I want to start with some early science, medicine, acad academia pieces here. Uh, Bernier, right, uh, the physician, a world traveler who publishes in 1684 the new divisions of Earth, right, um, the biological underpinnings of white supremacy. When I say supremacy, I am talking about a, a hierarchy of sorts. And what we begin to see in some of these canonized publications, right, is the idea that subjectivity is, is often passed off as objectivity in good science, right? So my opinions about things um, take on a life of their own within academia, right? Based on aesthetics, right? What you look like versus what I look like, we begin to see some of the earliest writings here. And again, these are canonized works. These are folks that have to be studied and understood as a part of academic pursuit, right? Moving into Linnaeus, who takes categorization, you know, we have flora, we have fauna, we're beginning to categorize human beings now. And it is here in which you begin to see crystallized the language of hierarchy. When we look at how the American, and in this case, he's referring to indigenous folks, right? When we look at these adjectives and we compare them to the adjectives used to describe the European, the Asian, the African, we begin to see that there is definitely some preferential treatment to say the least, right? Given to the European at the expense of these other categories, right? So the categorization in and of itself is extremely important, but the meaning attached to these categories begins to form the sort of pyramid, the sort of triangle in which the European is placed at the top as having the best qualities, if you will. And so when I talk about supremacy, this is what I'm talking about. It is the idea that we inherently have better traits 
than other folks, right? And this work is just continuously built on. Minor comes along eventually and makes the case that, uh, you know, not only are we different, but because of our differences in virtue, there's a huge difference in what can be tolerated by some groups versus others. And so if we, if we recognize that by 1619, you know, folks are coming in mass um, through the, the earliest days of the slave trade, then by 1785, right, well over 100 years later, um, we begin to see, you know, some very dangerous language that justifies systems of abuse, oppression, slavery, based on the idea that it's okay, they can tolerate it, they can take it. And when I do this work on medical mistrust in African American communities, one of the things I point to are modern day headlines that hold up these notions and might help explain why we have disproportionate outcomes in our healthcare systems to say uh, nothing of some of our other institutions, right? Um, law enforcement, right? Which is to this day, such a hot button controversial topic, right? But yet another institution in which we are supposed to collectively be able to depend upon, right? The, the thing I like to point out is that the slave trade gave rise to an industrial revolution, which gives rise to cities and their populations really booming. Particularly, I wanna to point to the UK and say that it is by 18, 1829 that we begin to see the rise of the urban policing, right? The Metropolitan Police Department comes online in 1829 in the UK and the US is one of the first nations to copy that model with Boston in 1838 and New York City in 1845, right? Now, mind you, at this time, for instance, in New York, um, the black population is only roughly 6% in the city of New York at that time. Um, but the consequences um, from what's coming, you know, will, will prove um, foundation, right? And part of that has to do with the fact that for so many Americans, we come from various parts of the world, right? But when we just hone in on Europe alone, what we saw in Northern cities before African-Americans even came to the North in mass, what we already had was a system of hierarchy, largely enforced in part by police, right? Which places the WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, at the top of the pyramid, right? Then you have your Germanic, your Irish, your Slavic, right? And when we look at what was mass produced, some of these images you see over here on the right side of the screen, what is said about people from these various parts of Europe, what we begin to understand is the concept of whiteness has not yet taken form. Who gets to be white and who doesn't? And what does that mean? What, what does that say about who you are, what you have access to, what you don't have access to, right? This hierarchy is enforced by law enforcement in part, right? And so this is before, again, this is before the arrival in mass of African-Americans. So this is what they're walking into. So you can imagine what happens when we begin to populate Northern cities in mass, right? In the earliest days of policing, you basically had two types of police, one in the North, one in the South, militias up North, right? And the thing I always like to point to is the fact that in both the North and the South, if you are able-bodied, and aesthetically appear to be white, then you were expected to be a part of this police force. You didn't have an option. There could be fines. If you were wealthy, you might be able to wiggle out of it. But otherwise, you're recruited into this, this system. So whether you're in the North or the South, the entire white populace is empowered 
to police black and brown bodies and dispense justice on the scene. On the scene, right? No, no juries, no, there's none of that, right? It's important to recognize that they had that in common. The North and the South, we like to tell a story that I love to challenge about how different we think they are. Uh -huh. So what leads in part to this mass of, right, black folks moving to the North in the first place is the rise of the Klan after the Civil War. We might have lost the war, but we're not gonna lose our way of life. We're not gonna lose our culture and we're not going to allow this roving band of you know, dangerous black men to have their way with white womanhood all up and down the countryside because that was the story they told themselves, right? And that had to be stopped at all cost. Huh? And in support of that, right? As black and brown folks are rushing to the North to escape that danger, right? Particularly um, after reconstruction is ended and Northern troops are pulled out of the South, we have the so-called, you know, Northern liberal, right? Coming out of Harvard University, publishing the widely disseminated book, The Negro Problem, and reaffirming what had been said in the South for decades, all right? These folks are a danger to this country. That is the story we are telling ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it has consequences for how we divvy out resources, all right? It has consequences for insurance companies and what they're willing to uphold and back and not back, right? It's codified in other words, right? It moves from narrative to policy. Hmm? And from policy, it's a short jump to law enforcement, right? Founder of the first criminal justice department in modern policing, sought to professionalize the police force coming out of UC Berkeley, the, the, the bastion of one, one bastion of liberal thought in the United States, right? But this is him, he's teaching classes in part on racial types and how heredity and race degeneration can lead to criminality. What else would he teach given the, the environment in which he's moving through, right? This is the story we teach. The Great Migration is that movement north that I keep referring to, right? The largest internal movement of any group in American history. And the North always patted itself on the back for being liberal, but that liberalism is tested during this time period. Mm -hmm. And what we began to see is the rise of fires, riots, uh, lynchings in the street, not in the South, in Northern cities as the population begins to shift. Uh, 1917, we see St. Louis on fire around race and racism for the first time, right? But maybe you weren't into law enforcement, and maybe you weren't into academia, and maybe you didn't move in those kinds of circles, and so you weren't exposed to those kinds of ideas, but the one area that was excellent at spreading narrative, regardless of your chosen field of endeavor, was pop culture, right? And it is clear from multiple thinkers that it is pop culture indeed, which is so successful at spreading the story that we live with, right? The distinction between scholarly and scientific versus popular is far from clear cut, right? 
we hear that from Jehoda, James Lowen notes, almost no genre of popular culture goes untouched by race, right? And the great Baldwin notes that the country's image of the Negro, which has it very much to do with the Negro, has never failed to reflect with the kind of frightening accuracy the state of mind of the country. Yeah. Our first form of American pop culture in the United States is the blackface minstrel. Take note of that. The first time an American cultural product can be observed in multiple places and you're getting the same show, it's the blackface minstrel. By 1911, Hollywood comes online, and by 1915, uh, Hollywood produces its first feature-length motion picture, which is The Klansman, aka Birth of a Nation. I hope you see a pattern, right? By 1920, between 1922 and 29, U.S. homes uh, begin getting radios in mass, right? We go from 60,000 to 10 million. And what is the, the number one most popular radio program? Amos and Andy, huh? two white men on the radio, basically playing as black men. It's a continuation of the minstrel. It's on the radio now. Mm -hmm. And we go from radio to television in 51, right? America has this strange fetish with race. Right. And pop culture shows us that. Right. Shows us that. The story we tell impacts our litigation. I just want to quickly point out what you see in front of you are multiple cases in which multiple ethnic groups come before our court systems petitioning the courts to be recognized as white not because they want to be white but they want access they want access all right let's look at the reasoning why the courts might find that a group is not to be recognized as white scientific evidence well if we think back to the early scientific pieces i showed you then we can see where there's a problem there what is common knowledge? What is that even, right? Congressional intent and legal precedent. The narrative becomes the, the policy. The policy reinforces the narrative, which reinforces the policy, which reinforces the law. And round and round and round we go. Mm -hmm. Some 50 cases, 50 plus cases where we see this over and over again and the court lands on a different side depending on what year and what's going on in the culture at the time right this is far from scientific one minute we find you're not white the next minute you are the courts cannot seem to make up their mind on this question because that's what happens when you make stuff up in the first place of course you can't land on an answer right I want to speak briefly to the conservation movement and where it fits into this larger narrative. Perhaps one of the most uh, foundational voices in the rise of early conservation movement is Madison Grant. Many of you may already know this, but he is a eugenicist, right? One of the things I appreciate about Madison Grant is his candor here. All right. We have this thing we call uh, respectability politics, right? And I'll often go back to the example of Trayvon Martin when he was killed years ago. And how often you heard folks say things like, well, he shouldn't have been dressed a certain way. Hmm? There was all this controversy about his hoodie and what clothes he had on as though dressing a certain way would have saved his life. And I always like to remind folks, you know, MLK was killed in a suit. Mm -hmm. But Grant says flat out, speaking English, wearing good clothes and going 
to school and church does not transform a Negro into a white man. There you go. You can't talk your way out of this with the right kind of English. You can't dress your way out of this. It's bigger than that, right? This is one of the earlier founders of the conservation movement. And what the question begs, what are we looking to conserve and for whom, right? Who should have access to natural resources? Who should be able to move freely in the world? And what should they be able to see when they do so? Huh? H.F. Osborne coming out of the Zoological Society in 1916, those among other things, conservation of our race, right? Which has given us the true spirit of Americanism. It's not a matter either of racial pride or of racial prejudice. It is a matter of love of country, right? And when I think specifically about Vermont, I've had the opportunity to work with a few different groups that are Vermont-based um, and conservation-based. And one of the things I, I often like to point out is that like so many other bastions of Northern liberalism, Vermont is no different. There is a reason Vermont's population is what it is, right? There's a reason Vermont is one of the whitest states in the country. Huh? I also like to point out that for all of it, all of our uh, Northern feel good, right? When we look specifically at the voting numbers in 2020, more people voted for Trump the second time in Vermont than they did the first time. And I hear so many conversations when I work with groups in Vermont about the need to diversify. I'm not against diversity. But when you have an almost 90 some percent white state, maybe the conversation is between and among your white population as much as it is trying to figure out how to get another BIPOC person to sit at your table. Hmm. Maybe. These are just thoughts. Back in the 1970s, and then I'll move on, the Sierra Club asked itself, should we concern ourselves with the conservation problems of such special groups as the urban poor and ethnic minorities? 40% of the respondents were strongly opposed and only 15% were supportive. I was born in the 70s. This is an ancient history. Hmm? Not at all. The challenge to a sense of safety when one goes outdoors is not relegated to the past. Hmm? Vox Booker in the state of Indiana was moving through the woods with a group of friends celebrating the 4th of July and came in within inches of being lynched. And this is in 2020, right? And the Department of Natural Resources chose to do nothing. Um, I hear the stories. I've heard the stories of my ancestors share within our family about our relationship to nature and what it meant to move through the great outdoors without a sense of safety, without a sense of being welcome. And unfortunately, to this day, I don't personally feel like I can take for granted that my ability to engage with the outdoors is necessarily safe. And I can't imagine I'm the only person who feels that way. And when we see these headlines, when you hear from this young man, you begin to get a sense of what it's going to take collectively to not just legislate equity, right? That in and of itself is not enough. Unfortunately, we cannot legislate story. That's what we cannot legislate. And if you can't address the root narrative, 
then the laws will have a limited impact, to say the least. All right. The Northeast, as I referred to just a moment ago, the Northeast at one point had a larger BIPOC population. But as the Great Migration took place and as more and more African Americans moved into Northern spaces, we began to see an upswell in violence. Hmm? Vermont itself had no all white counties until the 1930s. Hmm? Just let that sink in. Vermont had no all white counties until the 1930s. Right? I'll leave this here for a moment just so you can look at some of this. Maine, New Hampshire, right? Over and over again, we see this pattern, this not in my backyard diversity. Huh? It's been argued that the North won the Civil War. Hmm? I don't know. Maybe the North won the Civil War, but I, I keep coming back to this question. Who won the narrative? Right? Who won the narrative? This picture to the far right was taken on January 6th in the Capitol building. That man is from Delaware. Delaware. Not Mississippi, Delaware. Hmm? The, the arguments we're having about flags and statues right now. This is the story we live with. And for all of the laws we've had, of all the history we've had, of all the celebrations we have and the honorings and the you know, MLK days and all of that, at the end of the day, the world is changing. New England is changing, and the story we tell has yet to shift with the times. And so if we don't shift the story, but the population continues to shift, what does that do to our ability to see one another, to hear from one another, to lean into one another, to share story with one another? Hmm? New England states specifically are rapidly changing. And again, I don't know that just inviting some black and brown folks to come join you somewhere is going to get it. Not when you have a huge population of white residents who have yet to have space, systemic space to talk to one another about what it means to be in the New England states, what it means to be in Vermont, even as your population is shifting so rapidly. Hmm? Maybe that's the work. Maybe just setting the, the table for folks so that when they arrive, they understand that they are indeed welcome there. Maybe that's the work. I appreciate you giving me your, your time and your attention. Um, it's my understanding that we may have some, some Q and A to shift into, but I will hand it back over to Amir and go from there. Thank you, brother. Brother Delma, thank you so much. I cannot express to you more gratitude, um, you know, well, what I didn't mention before is that uh, Delma and I know each other from uh, my days at University of Michigan when, uh, and he continues to bring his brilliance to University of Michigan Flint. Uh, we are so grateful for this knowledge, especially in terms of how you've made that direct connection to uh, 
the realities in Vermont. So thank you very much. To facilitate our uh, Q&A, uh, our Inclusive Excellence Educator, Sarah Mel, will, uh, will take the reins from here. Thank you so much, Amir. And thank you so much, Delma and Kavita, for holding this space. I want to reflect back that um, we've already had a couple of folks who had to leave a little bit early and, and that one of those people shared that this is, uh, that they've never been so sad to have to leave a Zoom presentation. Uh, and, and that is one of our faculty friends over at the Community College of Vermont. And, um, and I, I would echo that this presentation for me um, felt so intentional and so rooted and so such a beautiful reminder that there is no need to rush the process of learning. So thank you for that. Um, we have thank folks you. who have, uh, you know, deep, deeper curiosity about both of your entrance into this work, uh, that what was there uh, a person, a moment, a course, uh, an aha that pulled you into this heart work of, of unpacking and um, connecting racialization, colonization to our understanding of the earth and our connections with and to it as well? Javi, I don't know if you wanna start with that. I'm, I'm happy to as well, but I feel like I've been talking a lot. <laughs> Can you say the question one more time, Sarah? I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So folks are asking a little more about your own personal entrance into this work. Um, uh, that what was there a, a particular inspirational moment, a particular learning moment, or connection with a person, a place, an ancestor, etc. That mm. that really helped to root you in in entering the kind of work that you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for saying repeating it. Um, yeah, um, there's there's a few different threads that come to mind when I hear that question, but the one I'll go to is um, I had a, a privilege coming out of college. I um, helped a startup nonprofit that was like the internet was just emerging to date myself. <laughs> and um, we were wondering how we could use the internet to support um, education, middle school and high school age group specifically, but um, sort of looking at how Eurocentric most of the curriculum that was being offered students um, in American schools was. And, you know, this nonprofit was based in San Francisco and the Mission District is where it kind of started out with and Mission High School had a 65% dropout rate, um, predominantly um, kids of color and nothing of relevance to their lives was being taught in those schools, right? And so, um, I had this, after many years of fits and starts of learning how to start a nonprofit and all of this, we finally launched and I had the um, honor to travel to countries overlooked in most American textbooks to write about culture and history, but really to focus in on inspiring folks creating solutions for their own communities. And so I would travel to these places and hear by word of mouth of some folks who were doing some extraordinary work in their communities. and. And I had this experience. I was like in my young 20s, I was an, a budding activist in the, from the Bay Area, you know, and I went to these and I had this, a very similar experience happened to me time and time again in very different contexts, whether it was in, you know, desert ridden Western Rajasthan or, you know, the plains outside of Cusco, Peru, or in Zimbabwe, you know, just many different parts of the world, a very similar experience where I would come to interview these people and um, I would just be kind of overwhelmed by their humility. It felt very different than the activist world I had been a part of in the Bay Area. And more often than not, they were like, I don't, I don't really need attention or accolades. You know, it's sort of like they would pose back to me the question of what, well, what else would I be doing with my life? This is, this is my place. These are my people. Of course, I'm going to show up, you know, these were heroes, heroes doing, um, saving ecosystems and, um, and people's lives. And, and so when I came back to the US, it really kind of put in a new light, like um, a lot of questions for me as to, as to why so many of the activists I, I knew and loved kind of 
we're just like focused on what we were working against, you know, the man, the corporation, whatever it was we were working against. And, and that, that field of activism was often one that people would burn out from. Right. And, and then we, we'd love to talk about all the sellouts who would like become yuppies and get like whatever their jobs in the suburbs, you know, and, and it just like, I, and, and so I really just, I got really disillusioned about sort of the, the world of activism I had been a part of in this country. And it, um, I started to really think about and, and sort of steep in my own learning. This is um, early, you know, 2000, 2001. And this is sort of how I found my way into being a facilitator and um, an anti-racism trainer. And all of this was, was sort of progressed out of this lineage of, um, sort of wondering like where that sense of like almost apathy or a lack of accountability to, to place stems from. And then of course, when you just start to think about the history of this country and this history of displacement, whether by choice or by force, that's at the root of, um, of so many of our stories here, um, it all starts to make sense. And so I, you know, it's sort of, that that's sort of been my trajectory and, and being a child of immigrants who came to this country myself, you know, this and seeing sort of the um, kind of the struggle for belonging that both of my parents have have gone through in their very different ways. Um, these questions around belonging and place and how to find right relationship to place, even though I'm not of this place and how to um, how to find you know, that quality of accountability and purpose that I, I felt from so many of these communities that I had the privilege to meet, I think is a part of how I would answer um, what this trajectory has been for me. Do you wanna speak? Yeah, I, I can't add much, honestly. For me, um, it really was encountering the center of all communities. And when I, they came to Flint, before I'd ever heard of them and did a workshop on storytelling. I had no idea when I went out to Vermont, they were actually as focused on environmental work as they were. I felt a little bamboozled because that wasn't really my interest. I was like, oh, whatever. But it was through meeting thought leaders who all kind of came to Vermont together for that first retreat and hearing the stories and being able to see my own story reflected in that that kind of hooked me in um, and it made it feel important to, to, to include the environmental sustainability piece into the larger framework in which I've been moving. That's my short answer, yeah. Thank you, thank you both. We have um, a number of questions from guests in the audience and I uh, can say that we won't probably get to all of them. But um, many of them come from a similar theme that uh, that one one in particular I think articulates well, which is naming that we host many diversity events. There are many diversity events that that folks have been attending um, here in Vermont uh, and at UVM over the years, and nothing usually changes afterwards. So how does one help senior administration as well as the general public actually do something, take some next steps? Um, to ad address the the all, all of what you started to open up for us, Delma and, and Kavitha, to address where we can go next, how to, uh, for me, I keep thinking of uh, how to explore narrative and who's in charge of it and who's been excluded from the narrative here in Vermont um, and, and, and at UVM. Thanks, Delma. I one of the one of the places I want to point people to is um, on the Center for Whole Communities website. We have a blog section, and there's a blog that Delma wrote. Um, maybe it was last year. I don't remember. Um, Confessions of a Black Facilitator in Largely White Spaces, and it's it's a really powerful um, story from Delma's perspective about what it's like. So you know that's what we do at Center for Whole Communities. We, we partner. We we don't come in and do. DEI work and Delma's blog will share sort of our stance around that necessarily, but we partner with organizations who are really um, willing to move into a process of change, right? And to recognize that that 
trajectory isn't going to be linear. We're not going to be able to come in and be like, okay, in six months, X, Y, and Z is what's going to happen. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a non-linear messy process that involves like being okay with failure, learning from failure, learn, it involves discomfort and personal reflection. Right. And so, um, those are some of the things that I would speak to. And, um, I'm going to put one other, this isn't directly answering that, but part of what's emerged out of Center for Whole Communities work um, and partnerships in the state of Vermont specifically is an environmental justice network that's kind of the first BIPOC-led EJ network in Vermont and folks at UVM are involved and um, folks at the uh, Rights and Democracy Institute are involved and stuff. So I'll put that website in here too. But Delma, do you have any thoughts as we're closing too? Uh, thank you for that copy and thank you for that shameless plug. I owe you like five bucks or something. I don't know. We can talk about that <laughs> later. But <clears throat> no, I <laughs> no, I would just say um, to Kavi's point is this: the non-circular piece is the part I think that I find both most realistic and the most frustrating. And so, um, Anytime something is circular, it can feel like you're not making progress. You're not going anywhere. You're not doing anything, you know. Um, and so to that point, um, making space for folks to show up, to tell the story, understand their story, be sloppy, ugly cry together, disagree vehemently and still want to remain in community with one another to do the good work. That is a, a very nonlinear answer that may not satisfy. I apologize, but that is where I've landed on this question. And so, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, a friend of mine and colleague once said, I, I, I grant you permission to be raggedy in a space. And I have long loved that as, as a reminder that we all get to do, as we do this work together, we often need to show up. Uh, in those sloppy, raggedy ways and, and have some humility and some care for one another in that process. Uh, I'm conscious of time. I would love for this conversation to continue. And we know that many of our colleagues on the call uh, have other things that they need to attend to. Uh, we wanna remind folks who have joined us today to please fill out an evaluation of today's session and uh, give us your feedback about what worked, what you'd like to know more about. Tonight, uh, as a part of the Inclusive Excellence Symposium, we have a panel of folks uh, talking about equitable climate action uh, and, and co-hosted with our friends over in the Office for Sustainability and Center for Teaching and Learning. Uh, so that is tonight at four uh, and we hope that you'll join us. And then tomorrow we have our Dr. Wanda Heading Grant keynote with Majora Carter at four o'clock. Uh, that is a hybrid event, both at the Davis Center in the Grand Maple Ballroom for those who are local and feel comfortable coming into community in person and also online. And so we hope folks will join us for those next two events and also for our Friday morning keynote with Cody Two Bears uh, talking about empowering communities using renewable resources through a native lens. Um, we appreciate again, Kavitha and Delma so much you are joining us today and sharing your heart and your wisdom and your kindness. And we look forward to continuing to learn with and from you uh, and, and with all of us across the UVM community and further. Thank Thanks you so much, much for joining us today. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.